We are going through the book of Joshua. There's going to be some chapters that we're going to go over very quickly. I'm going to give you the rundown of the chapters as we get to them. Not today. We're going to still go by this one pretty much verse by verse. Uh, there's some things in there I think you need to see. There's some things I think you'll find interesting. God doesn't do anything by accident. It's interesting how things begin to be pulled out of the scriptures for what they are. And uh, how many of you believe that names are important? The names, the meanings of names are very important. And uh, a lot of things in the Bible, just they don't happen by chance, and their names are actually kind of interesting when you really start digging into them, what they mean. Uh, and in fact, sometimes the names are very prophetic of who they are uh, and what's going to come to be. They may not see it when they initially take the name, but what it becomes is a whole other story. And you're going to see that in a few minutes. But we're going to pick up in Joshua chapter 8. If you want to know where we're at, watch the videos, read up to where we're at. It'll help you catch up. Uh, if you're not here on Wednesday nights, well, be here on Wednesday nights. <laughs> we're, we're covering a lot on Wednesday nights. Uh, and the Lord is definitely moving. I may start recording on Wednesday nights. I haven't decided yet. Um, so I can post that. But Wednesday nights are a little bit more until when we sit down and we really kind of dig a little bit more. But let's go ahead and look at a few things. We're coming up where Achan has been destroyed. His family has been stolen to death. His livestock... Everything that Achan had has been basically cast into the fire, burned up, gone. Uh, Achan walked in disobedience to the Lord. He was given very clear direction on what to do when they went in to Jericho. Achan decided he could not follow the plan of the Lord. It consequently cost 36 <coughs> people their lives, not to mention the lives of his own family. He decided that he couldn't follow instructions. He decided that, uh, you know what, that silver looks good, that garment looks good, a few of these things look really good, I think I'll take them and hide them in my tent. Now, I think I'll keep my sin to myself and I'll cover it up so no one sees it. And, well, no one will really know because it's done in the privacy of my own home. Well, can I tell you that the sin that's done in the privacy of your own home, God is very much so aware of. And when he's given you very clear direction, very clear instruction, do not do this. Do not touch this. Do not go there. Do not have anything to do with this. And you decide you want to play with fire. All right? Consequently, you can cause everyone around you to have issues. Because of your disobedience. Because whenever God makes a statement that applies to everybody, and you're under that statement, you're under that authority, you're under that whatever you want to call it, under that cover, and God says, look, this is for all of you, don't do this. And you decide you want to do your own thing, you, again, in turn, can affect everybody around you. So it's very important in ministry that everybody be on the same page, everybody be in agreement with what's going on. You don't have to agree in every intimate detail. But you do have to be in agreement with the overall direction and vision of the ministry. If it's going to work, everybody's got to be in that much of agreement. I'm not looking for yes people. I think any minister that's looking for yes people is trying to develop a cult. Okay? I don't want you to always agree with everything I say because I could be wrong. I need you to let me know if I'm being wrong or if I'm being foolish. I need that. Okay? And i got shoulders big enough that I can carry that if I am being wrong or being foolish. I can handle that. Please tell me. But we have to work together. We have to be in agreement. We have to move forward together. Now, if you decide you want to get a bug up your butt, decide to do your own thing in your own way and be rebellious to what God is calling all of us to do, that can actually affect everybody. How would you feel that sin got exposed? That God made very clear that you're not supposed to do that and you get called out in front of everybody. How would that feel? Not so good. Well, for again, it cost him his life, his wife's life, his children's lives, the lives of his livestock, and everything that he had was destroyed because of his foolishness. There is no dollar amount. There is no garment. There is no nothing that is worth having the judgment of God come upon you. Now, please understand my heart when I say this. I'm not saying you need to follow everything we say and everything we do to the T because <coughs> unless God has given a clear direction for us all, it's between you and the Lord. But if he has given a clear direction for us all, then we are to follow that. Amen? Is that fair? If you're part of a particular house, you follow the rules of a house. It's like having children. Children in your house, guess what? They follow your rules. Until they come up underneath your house, they decide they can't follow the rules. Let them go to somebody else's house. Namely their own. Okay? However, God does set up order. He sets up structure. He sets up leadership for a reason. It isn't so he can keep you from things. It's to protect you from things. God knew what he was doing. He was trying to bring about deliverance. He was trying to put the children of God in a clear direction, one of learning to trust and lean upon Him, and to go in and possess the promise that God had made to them. 
And they were doing just fine until someone decided, you know what, I'm going to try it my way. Well, it didn't work out so hot. Like I said, there was a price to be paid. When we pick up in chapter 8, the price has been paid. Now catch what happens here in the very first verse of chapter 8. Now the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. Take all the people aboard with you and arise. Go up to Ai and see I have given into your hand the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. Whenever the thing of sin was removed, God starts speaking again. God starts giving direction again. God starts opening doors again, saying, look, the plan I have for you is still in place. Now get back on track. Go do what I called you to do. I have given you this into your hand. Go do it. Prior to that, they didn't seek the Lord. They went a little overconfidence. Only took about 3,000 men. This time they take over 30,000. <laughs> they weren't playing no games this time. And they had actually heard clearly from the Lord, do this. How many of you have ever gotten ahead of God? Try to do your own thing, go out in your own way. Man, I know God's called me to it. Let's go do it. But God didn't say do it yet. And you get out there and the next thing you know, you're on your face, you clean yourself off, trying to put cotton up your nose because you busted your nose pretty good, and you're looking foolish because you got ahead of God. It's always better to wait. Seek the Lord first. Seek His counsel first before you do anything. The Bible says to worry about nothing but to pray about everything. Your worry can cause you to make actions and take actions you shouldn't take. Because it can get you off focus and get you going in a direction you don't need to go. See, worry can make you jump the gun. Worry can make you react before it's time to react. And so I have to relate back to martial arts because I know what I know. When you're training, people will jump, they'll do things like that, and you'll, you'll react. Reality is, the person's six feet from you, why are you reacting? You can't touch them. They can't touch you. Why are you jumping? Well, well, you were worried. You were in fear. And even then, you have to be aware of, okay, is that a full act or are they just twitching? Because even when they get close, they can twitch and make you jump, and all of a sudden now you've reacted and they've got you. So you train in martial arts and fighting in general to set people up for the next thing. You try to make them do something. You try to get them to move in such a way that's going to cost them. You know the devil does that to us all the time? He jumps and twitches and moves in different ways to try to get us to react a certain way. And when he does, it opens us up for attack. If I want to open up somebody in their body, I'm going to act like I'm going to punch them in the head and get them to raise up so I can attack their body. If I want to attack their head, I'm going to try to get them to lower the guard so I can go for the head. He does the same thing in the body of Christ. He will get you to raise or lower depending on what he's trying to do so he can come in and attack the area that he's trying to attack. He'll do that in your home. He'll do that in your business. He'll do that in every area of your life. He'll get you worried to make you jump the gun. Instead of learning to rest in the Lord and wait on His counsel to move, we try to go in the power of our own strength, and well, we pay the price because of it. But this time, the Lord is now speaking. The sin has been dealt with. It's been killed off, literally. It's a heavy price to pay. But now God is speaking again and giving direction. How many of you feel like you haven't been hearing from the Lord clearly lately? That happened? I know it happens to me. Maybe because you're not walking with Him the way you should. Maybe it's because you're walking in your own confidence and ability. I've been walking with the Lord for 30 years. Fantastic. When's the last time you heard from Him? Okay, quite all of a sudden. <laughs> There's people that I've heard, I've been in this walk for 50 years, 60 years, and they look like they just ate a sour apple or something. It was just bad. They're like, like that. <laughs> X-Lex? I don't know. What's, what's wrong with you? Something wrong with you. Fiber? That'd be sold something. Because you are jacked up right now. What is going on with you? But they say, I walk in the joy of the Lord, and they look like they're in severe pain. <laughs> if that's the joy of the Lord, I don't want it. Reality is, they're, they're going through a ritual for 50 years. When you have a relationship with the Lord, there is a peace that settles upon you. There is a joy that begins to develop in your life. There, is, there literally is a physical change that takes place in the body when you're walking in the Lord. I've seen people that walk in the Lord. They, they literally have a glow about them. And it doesn't matter how old they are. And they have a joy about them and a vigor and a fight about them. It's just like, man, how do you do that? Well, I, I walk with the Lord every day. I 
I'm talking with the Lord every day, and he talks to me. And it's amazing. You know, Pastor Lindsey Croft, I'll never forget him. He's about this big, white hair, curly, southern accent, but on fire for the Lord. But, man, he had such a joy about him. But, man, there was a power <laughs> about him that you just, you knew he walked with the Lord. There was no question. There was no doubt. Nothing. Why? Because he took time every day to be with the Lord. But there was this uncanny knowing that whatever he did something, it was the Lord. Or he would wait. He said, no, nope, sorry, not going to do it. I just, I haven't got direction on the Lord from that. I'm not moving. It's kind of like Cliff. Cliff said, I haven't got direction on the Lord. I'm not moving. Until I know it's God, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not doing anything. Confusion comes into camp. Whoa! Time out. <clears throat> Take a step back. Something's not jiving right here. I've got to wait and see what the Lord says. And that's in every area of his life. He doesn't, it's, a, it's an immediate reaction. Something gets flaky. Oh, time. <laughs> What's the Lord doing? What's going on? Where's the Lord in this first? I think if we can all learn from that perspective, we'll be much better off. If we can learn from someone else's experience, we'll grow much faster in our walk with the Lord. That's wisdom. It's not just not repeating what they do, but learning from it and excelling beyond my goal as an instructor, even when I was in martial arts, or even now, is to make you better than me. It's to make your walk stronger than mine. It's to help you along and to do things that I never did or couldn't do because I just didn't have the understanding. So that we can excel exponentially by growing from one another. That's the way it should be. Every good teacher should want that for his students, that the students will one day be better than them. That's what it's about. Christ, he said, look, the works that I do and greater will you do. The Son of God said, I want you to do greater works than me, and you will do them when you walk in me. But you've got to have that communication. You've got to have that relationship. So God is now speaking again to Joshua, telling him exactly what to do. And this is what he says in verse 2. He says, And you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, only its spoil and its cattle. See, God added this time. Remember last time, it was only things that could be purified by fire. God added something else this time. He said, now you can keep the livestock. I'll give you a little bit more. See, whenever God knows that he can trust you, he'll start trusting you with more. Fair? It's really interesting. So Joshua rose and all the people of war to go up against Ai. Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. He's dividing his army. What is he doing? This is a military tactic. I'm going to send them out. I'm going to separate them. The other army really doesn't know what's going on. I'm going to have them go around. Tell me God doesn't give wisdom whenever you're walking with him. He tells them, Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind the city. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you be ready. Look, don't get too far away that you can't react, but be far enough away where they don't really notice you. This is planning. This is a battle strategy. This is a good battle strategy. Okay? And he goes on, he, start, he keeps laying out the strategy of what's going to happen. And here, whereas before they lost because of their false confidence, God says, you know what? All things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. I'll flip the enemy's tactic on Him. I will use the same thing that the enemy used to defeat you to defeat your enemy. It's really cool. So it goes on, it says, And I and all the people who are with me will approach the city. They will come about when they come out against us as at the first that we shall flee before them. For they will come out after us till we have drawn them from the city. For they will say, they are fleeing before us as at the first. Therefore, we will flee before them. God's given direction. Look, you do this, this is exactly what's going to happen. Do this and you're going to have victory. Do it this way. I'll tell you exactly how the enemy is going to react. This is godly wisdom. This isn't just wisdom that Joshua will come up with off the cuff. This is the sermon that came from the Lord. God is speaking to Joshua, telling him exactly what he needs to do. He says, Then you shall rise from the ambush, seize the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it into your hands. So he's encouraging them. Look, I'm not going to be with you, but be of good courage. The Lord will deliver the city into your hands. So sometimes God may call us to different areas of battle. You know what? Your pastor may not be able to go with you. Your men's leader may not be able to go with you. Your women's leader may not be able to go with you. Your brother may not be able to go with you. You know what? It's okay. When God makes a promise, he is faithful to deliver. Okay? God bless you. 
He is faithful to do what he said he will do. Don't ever lose hope because, well, the pastor can't, or my brother can't, or my sister can't. If God's calling you to it, he will bring you through it. Amen? Amen? Period. It's very easy. Why? They're coming off of a loss. They're really embarrassed by what happened. Emotionally, they're done. Mentally, they're done because of everything that's happened. They just saw an entire family die because of a mistake. I'd be a little bit messed up, too. Here's the thing, guys. You can't stop sometimes. You don't have the option of stopping. You've got to keep going. So here's Joshua doing what Joshua was commanded to do, being an encouragement. Hey, come on. It's not over. God's got this. God is going before you. He will be faithful to deliver the, the city into your hands. The promise that he's made to you, he will place in your hands. Trust him. Be of good courage. Be not dismayed. Don't let what's happening to you, what you're perceiving to be happening to you, don't let that tear you down. Keep on going. God's got it. Trust in the Lord. The Bible says what? To lean not on your own understanding. You've got to trust God. And your understanding could mess you up from time. They can keep you from doing what God tells you to do because it don't make sense to you. There are business strategies and things that God puts out there for us to do as His children that make no sense in the business world. But God will take it and just prosper. It's awesome. There are certain things. He'll have you ask people for certain things. You're like, why am I asking them for this? Because the Lord told me to ask them for this. And there are people that I don't know why I'm doing this the whole time they're doing it. <laughs> they may not even be believers, but God will move on their parts to do certain things. And they can't even tell you why they're doing it. But because you were obedient to the Lord, God opens up doors that no man can shut. And he will shut doors that no man can open. Amen? Amen. So he's encouraging them. He's building them up. How many of you come here on Sundays to be built up? How many of you come in here on Sundays to be encouraged? Good. You should come to the house of the Lord to be encouraged. You should have that ability. You know what? I know at least one place I can go during the week and be filled up and be built up and know that God is in the house and know that, you know what? The darkness may be around, but I can go one place at least once a week and okay. know that God is going to meet me there. No matter what my need is, and know that he's going to be there. We need that encouragement. Does that mean every message that's preached is going to be that happy message? going to be, whoo, when you leave out of here, you feel like you're on cloud nine. No. There's a difference between me stroking your emotions and building your spirit. I can be that pastor that makes you feel all warm and fluffy and fuzzy inside. But when you walk out that door, you still got an enemy you've got to face, and where's that going to leave you? You're not going to be able to stand. You're not going to do anything because that emotional high is now gone. And now you have a real enemy that you got to face that doesn't care about your emotions. He just wants to take you out. My job is not to make you happy. My job is to bring you to the presence of the Lord, that will help lead you, rather, and to the presence of the Lord, that His joy may be your strength. And when you walk up out of here, you can face no matter what devil comes before you, and you can stand because God is in you, He's working through you, and He will deliver you out of the hand of the enemy. Amen. It's not my job to make you happy. It's not my job to please you. And I can promise you I'm not going to. I'm going to please God. I'm going to please Jesus. I'm going to please the leading of the Holy Spirit. If that makes you happy along the way, great. That's a good addition. But I'm not standing up here as pastor to make you happy. It's not going to happen. I love each and every one of you dearly. I do. I love him more. I love him more than my wife. I love him more than my children. I love God more than all of you. Because if I don't love Him that way, there's no way that I can serve any of you. There's no way that I can lead any of you. I can't lead my wife. I can't lead my children. I definitely cannot lead this ministry if I don't love God more than all of you. But those of you who know me know that I care. Those of you who know my heart know that I care. And I do things that most pastors, you would never dream of a pastor doing it because it's just not the pastor thing to do. And I don't say that to pat myself on the back or build me up. I, just, I don't. I just see things that pastors do and they say, well, I, I, I'm a pastor and I just want to wring their neck. Uh, because they use their title to lord over people. I'm this and I, I don't care who you are. You're still a man. I don't care what title you have on the end of your degree. You're still a person. We still serve the same God. These are still His sheep. You're one of His sheep. 
How dare you think you're better than somebody else? We are to serve all just as Christ did. If you're going to call yourself a pastor, you better love yourself than anybody else. Don't be scared to get your hands dirty, right? I don't know why that came out, but that wasn't even part of my notes. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Sorry, I have certain things that really bug me sometimes, and they just come out through the scripture, and God brings it out. And I think some of you are probably dealing with the very same things. You look at people a certain way, and you see pastors a certain way, and you see things going, and you really get your crawl, as it were, and you're like, know that it's not God. That's the flesh. Don't be angry with them. I try not to be angry with them because I realize it is the flesh, and I realize it is. It, it, I'm not fighting them. Sometimes I wish I could because it would probably make me feel better for a moment. Um, it's, it, it's a missed understanding of who God is. It's, it's a relationship with religion instead of Jesus Christ. And that's what comes out. Whenever they're up here and it's all about them and it's all about who they are and all those stuff, that's, that's, it's supposed to be about Jesus. It's supposed to be about the gospel message that Christ saves, that he, he came for those that are hurting, those that are lost, those that are sick, those that are desperately in need of a Savior. He came for them. He came to restore the lost children of Israel, the ones that thought they knew God and had no understanding of Him because of traditions of man. And He came to bring them home back to Dad. He also came to bring those that were not of the Jewish family home to be with Dad. He said, those are people you don't know that I'm going to draw. That's us. <laughs> we got grafted into the family. That's awesome. But this morning, you need to be of good courage. If you're walking with the Lord, be of good courage. If you're not, you better get back. Because now you're outside of his umbrella. You're outside of what he can do. It's like my kids, I love you and I'll protect you as long as I know that you're doing what you're supposed to do. You get outside of that, you're on your own. Well, that's not love. Yes, it is. That's exactly what God does. You want to get outside of what I ask you to do? You're on your own. When I've given you clear direction, when I've given you clear understanding, and I've opened up for you, hey, do this, do it this way, don't do this, stay away from that, and you want to go play with it, don't complain. Read Proverbs chapter 1. It's a very clear understanding. Trust the Lord, honor the Lord, be of good courage. Do not be dismayed this morning. God's called you to it, He will bring you through it, period. If He's made you a promise, He's faithful to that promise. Whether you are not, God is faithful to the promise. Remember, it took Abram, the family of Abram, 400 and something years before they walked into the promise of the Lord. God is still faithful to his promise even when we get it messed up. Don't stop. Because what he's promised he's made to you, your children, your children's children, should the Lord not return anytime soon, which he may could, he could return before we finish the message today. But trust his promises to be true. And go with it. We get back to the scripture. It goes on, and it will be, like I said, it will be when you have taken the city that you shall set the city on fire. According to the commandment of the Lord, you shall do. Bless you. See, I have commanded you. Joshua therefore sent them out, and they went to lie in ambush. Okay? It says, But Joshua lodged that night among the people. He got up early in the morning, verse 10, went up with the people and the elders before. Ai, he got their attention. He drove the army out, got their attention. Everybody in Ai is like, "Woo, party time! Let's go take out the children of Israel." We won once. Let's go do it again. It says in verse eleven, says, "And all the people of war who were with him went up and drew near, and they came before the city and camped on the north side of Ai. Now, a valley lay between them and Ai. So he took about five thousand men to set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai. So here he is separating again on the west side of the city. Some are on the back side. Now some are on the west side." Right? Again, he's dividing up. He's setting up an ambush. He's making it look like they're weak. Because remember, when they first went against them, there's only 3,000 people that went against them to begin with. And they just walked all over them. So guess what happens? Awesome. Verse 13, they, they camp out in the midst of the valley. It says, then verse 14, now it happened when the king of Ai saw it that the men of the city hurried and rose early and went out against Israel to battle, he and all his people, and at an appointed place before the plain, but he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. So all the people who were in Ai were called together to pursue them. And they pursued Joshua and were drawn away from the city. There was not a man left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. 
Every man in the city that could take up arms went out. See, this is where pride and arrogance can get you in trouble real fast. We want us guys, let's everybody go this time. Let's everybody do this this time. See, sometimes in your own confidence, you can get ahead of the thing and just take all of your eggs in one basket and end up suffering because of it. Because of pride, because of confidence. Well, I've done it before this way. I had overwhelming victory. And again, it's not that you can't look back at the overwhelming victory, but remember who gives you the victory. We can be very prideful and very confident. We're in all things what? We're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to be meek. We're supposed to be trusting in the Lord. It's not that you can't be confident in what you do, but don't let your uh, confidence overload your confidence. Because sometimes our confidence is far less than our confidence, and we get in big heap of trouble real fast. All right? So they all go out, and they all pursued Israel. Now, look at verse 18. There's something interesting that happens here in verse 18. You may just read over this, may not think anything about it. And the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the spear that is in your hand towards Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that was in his hand towards the city. Interesting. How did God take Israel out of Egypt? What was used? A staff. A simple walking staff. A simple shepherd's staff. Not an instrument of war. Not an instrument of battle. An instrument of an instrument of stability. An instrument of support. Now you have added to that the spearhead, which becomes now a weapon. A battle instrument. Because until they have rest, what? They would be fighting. We're supposed to put on every day the armor of the Lord, are we not? We should take up the armor of the Lord every day. That's battle gear, guys. In the New Testament, it says we're soldiers. And we're not to get concerned with the affairs of this life. How many of us have gotten concerned with some of the affairs of this life here recently? It's very easy to do, isn't it? Well, as a soldier, if you get concerned about the things of this life, <laughs> instead of paying attention to the battle that you're in, the enemy will get you. The enemy will cause you to stumble. He will cause defeat in your life when you get concerned about the things that are going on around you instead of the one that ordains all the things that are going on around you. When you lose your focus of the battle, the enemy will take you. It will happen. It can happen in an instant. So we have to be ever vigilant about what we're doing. We have to be always on guard, always sober-minded, Paul said. We've got to keep our wits about us. That's why we're not to be drunk. That's why we're not to be in those things that causes us intoxication in any way. Because it causes our mind not to be clear. It causes our mind not to be focused. Now catch this. It may not be drugs. It can be food. Pastor, what do you mean? There are certain food allergies that causes your mind to be foggy. It causes you to be messed up. It will keep you from hearing from the Lord because your mind is not working like it's supposed to. If your body's in constant pain, there are certain things that the body releases that will keep your mind from being able to focus the way that it needs to. There's a lot of things that we have to be very diligent of in our lives that we can stay on top of so that we can very clearly hear from the Lord. And that we know that we're hearing the Spirit, we know that we're being led by the Spirit. <coughs> Again, we have to be mindful. But it's interesting that now it's a spear instead of a staff. Joshua, or God commands Joshua to hold out the spear against them. Again, it's, it, it, it's a physical representation of really what's going on in the spiritual realm that we cannot see. Just as it was whenever Moses held up the staff when they were fighting. Whenever Joshua was battling when he was a young man. Now he's holding up a spear and pointing towards the area of destruction that God has already said, this is, this is committed to destruction, do it. He's telling him to hold out his spear. <clears throat> Now, it's interesting that he has to stand there the entire time with a spear, which means everyone else has got to do the fighting. Joshua's now the leader. He's the one standing out giving direction. It's an interesting concept of leadership. There are leaders. You've got to understand your leaders, guys. Sometimes they're not going to be necessarily in the battle with you. They can't. Because if they're in the battle with you, they're subject to destruction, which means they're not going to be able to lead effectively because they're, now they're having to do their own thing. It's not that they can't be in the battle, not that they should be in the battle, because remember David got in trouble because he didn't go to war. 
But there's a time and a place for the leader to be in the battle. And there's a time for the leader to be above the battle that he can see clearly and give good direction. All right? So again, God's a God of balance. God's a God of order. Trust the Lord in his leading. At this point, Joshua had to stop from fighting. Not that Joshua couldn't fight, but he had to stop and give direction. And also be a what? Point of reference. Point of strength. Because when you look back and you see your leader standing strong, how encouraging is that? To know that they're there and know that they're standing strong for you. They're standing strong with you. It's encouraging. See, when the enemy goes in, his first goal is to take out the leaders. That's exactly what he wants to do. Because if he does that, the flock will scatter. If you take out the shepherd, the flock will scatter. If you take out the general, the soldiers will scatter. The enemy always goes after the leaders. So those of you in leadership, the battle's going to be harder on your end. <laughs> There's no way around it. The battle is going to be more difficult on your end. It's going to come harder after you. Because all of those that you are responsible for, whether you realize it or not, will be affected if you are torn down. But walk in the power of the Lord. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Walk and trust in the Lord. So he's given direction. He's used in the spirit. So the ambush takes place. Now the people were close enough to see what was going on. They had enough sense to, okay, the city's empty, let's do this thing. When he turned the spear on them, everything changed. The people rushed the city, they took the city and set it on fire. They looked back at the city, and they couldn't go anything. Look at this, verse 1, it says, Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city, and that the smoke of the city ascended, they turned back and struck down the men of Ai. Then the others came out of the city against them, so they were caught in the midst of Israel. So on this side and some on that side, and they struck them down so that they let none of them remain or escape. But the king of Ai they took alive and brought him to Joshua. And it came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field and in the wilderness, where they pursued them. And when they all had fallen by the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that all the Israelites returned to Ai and struck it with the edge of the sword. So it was that all who fled that day, both men and women, excuse me, fell that day, were 12,000, all the people of Ai. For Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the spear until he had utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. Did not stop leading. Did not give up in the fight. Did not quit until it was done. How many of us give up halfway through the fight just because we're tired? We give up halfway through the fight because we're frustrated. Or because we get aggravated or angry or, you know, we, we lose hope somewhere through the course of the battle. And we just quit. Joshua stayed the course the whole time until it had been utterly destroyed. you got to remember, Jesus is standing there the entire time. He's not going to give up. He's not going to quit. He's not going to back down because the battle's already won. When you get weak, look to Jesus. When you get tired, look to Jesus. When you get frustrated, look to Jesus. When you give up hope, look to Jesus. Get your focus and your perspective back where it needs to be at. Get back in the fight and see the Lord's victory. Because what happens, what they're doing is they're binding up the strong men in each city. They're binding up their place of strength. They're binding up that, that place of comfort. What did they draw them out of the city for? So they can bind where they found their strength. The strength was in the city. Okay? I take out the strong man. What are you going to do now? They had nowhere to go. They were cut off. And God destroyed the enemy. And they went in and did the plundering in verse 27 according to that which they were supposed to do. So Joshua burned Ai and made a heap forever. A desolation to this day, the king of Ai hanged on a tree until evening. And as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his corpse down from the tree, cast it at the entrance of the gate of the city, and raise over it a great heap of stones that remains until this day. Again, humiliation. This is psychological warfare, this is spiritual warfare that's going out against all the other inhabitants of the land that they're going into. But catch this, how many of you know what the meaning of Ai is? The literal meaning of Ai is heap of ruins. <laughs> A little prophetic, isn't it? That the city that they went to attack, name literally means what it became. A heap of ruins. And it stayed that way. It was never rebuilt. But its name, even from the beginning, because you see it earlier in the, in the text, not here, but I believe it's in Genesis. 
but it literally was destined from the beginning to be nothing but a heap of ruins. Again, I think it's interesting the names that God uses. The place Bethel. How many of you remember what that means? So where Jacob wrestled with the Lord, the place was called Bethel. And what do you call it? He called it the house of God. So the valley that goes between those, you have the house of God on one, time, on one side and a heap of ruins on the other side. And Joshua was in the valley between the two. There's a lot of things that go on here in this passage. It's really interesting. Maybe you're in the valley right now. Between the house of God and the victory that's before you. Sooner or later, the enemy's going to come. But trust the Lord. If God has made you the promise, He's going to fulfill His promise. And you will have victory in that area of your life. It's okay to be in the valley. It's not a bad place to be. Because maybe that's where God exactly at this moment has you. It's in that valley. So He can show you His victory. So He can show you the promise that He made you. He is faithful to fulfill it in your life. And it doesn't matter what it is. And the enemy, the leader, the head will be brought down of your enemy. So when we go into battle, it's important that we take out the head, we take out the leadership. Just like the enemy's trying to take out our leadership, we need to take out the leadership. We need to bind them up. Because he was bound until the city was destroyed. When they got a hold of the king, he was bound until it was destroyed. Then they killed him. Isn't it interesting that at some point our Savior and our King is going to bind the enemy? He's going to cast him into a pit for a thousand years. He's going to be released for a thousand years. Then he's going to be bound again and cast into the lake of fire permanently. Isn't that interesting? So we see types of foreshadowing of things to come, and things in the past, and things that still apply today. Because what God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The principles that he sets up in battle are the same. They do not change. They still work. You may have to change the packaging a little bit depending on the battle that you're in. But trust the Lord. Face the enemy that's in front of you. Follow the instructions that God's given you. Well, those instructions don't make sense. His ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. His ways are higher above. Well, it doesn't make good business sense. That'll cost me to go bankrupt. I'm telling you, not listening to God will cause you to go bankrupt. Amen. Not honoring the Lord will cost you more than trying to do it your way. There's systems that we can follow, business systems that work great, but they're business systems as a man. And they're going to fall. They're going to, they're going to shatter. They're going to be gone somewhere. We follow God's plan. It will work out. And you will have blessing. You will have inheritance. You will have things that last. Because now they're based on things eternal, not things temporal. Man's systems are all temporal. Amen? Amen? Now catch what happens. This is really cool. I love this. This is probably my favorite part of the whole text. My personal favorite part. Joshua built an altar to the Lord, God of Israel, and Mount Ebal. He built an altar there. God gave victory. Joshua recognized that by building an altar. He set up a place of remembrance. He set up a place. This is where God showed up. God has a place of authority here. God has a place of remembrance here. This is where we can come meet with the Lord. We can worship the Lord. We can sacrifice unto the Lord. God is doing and has done something here and will continue to do something. He set up an altar. Beautiful. And he goes on, he says, As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the children of Israel, as it was written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man has wielded any iron tool, and they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. They were celebrating the victory of the Lord by building an altar and worshiping God. How often do you give God credit for the victories in your life? How often do you make that victory a place of remembrance, a permanent place of remembrance? Not just, oh, that was a good time. But when it was a clear victory, and you know it was the Lord, you set up a place that you could always look back to, immediately look back to, this is where the Lord has delivered me. David did it. He made it very clear. Lord, you delivered me from the lion. You delivered me from the bear. You delivered all these things. Lord, you did this, this, and this. He is declaring, God, you did this. This is a place of remembrance. This is an altar that he could immediately go back to in his heart. 
Immediately draw on the presence of God and be built back up again. Be encouraged in him. Have the strength of the Lord come back into his life. How often do you do that? Do you take those places of remembrance and call upon those things whenever you're down? Whenever the enemies come in and he's just waylaid you for whatever reason because maybe you weren't listening to the Lord or you got out on your own or whatever. But you can stop for a moment and really look back. So you know what, Lord, you delivered me here. You delivered me here. You brought victory here. God, you did this miracle here. You're the same God. You have not changed. And I know the situation is no different than any of those. And God, I know that I have victory on the other side of this. And start encouraging yourself in the Lord because God does not change. If he's brought you victory, he will bring you victory again. But if you're going to lie in defeat, you're going to lie in depression, you're going to lie in anxiety, you're going to lie in fear, then you're not trusting in the Lord. Very simple statement. Where fear begins, faith ends. It's really that simple. Because if our faith is in the Lord, then why are we afraid? If our faith is in the Lord, why are we fearful? Why are we worried? If we are trusting in God, then what do we have to fear? If God be for us, who can be against us? There is no created thing that can separate us from the love of God. In that, you've got to take the umbrella here. There's no created thing. Anything that falls under creation can separate you from God. None of it can. Learn to rest in Him. The Bible says we're to labor unto rest. We have to work at it. To rest in the Lord. Because, man, life happens and sometimes it just, man, it seems like it all falls apart at once. You're like, really? All at one time? Come on, God. I can't take anymore. Yes, you can. Because I got you. Are you sure? <laughs> I'm not feeling it right now, God. I'm really not. You guys are like, I, I'm there. <laughs> are you listening? What's that, that statement somebody's made? You know, teachers always silent whenever there's a test. Not that the teacher's not there. Teachers say, say nothing. Noah, build a boat. Here's the instructions. Go. God was silent for 120 years. He had to do ridicule, grief from all the people around him. You know people going by and like, what are you building? No. A boat? What's a boat? Why are you building a boat? It's going to rain. <laughs> rain? You've done lost your mind. You've been, you sunbaked, buddy. Something is wrong with you. You're building a boat because it's going to rain. I think we need to go talk to Adam. I think that was lost his mind. Adam may still been alive at this point. I don't know. I have to go back and look at the timeline. But think about that. Noah's out there just hammering away. Now he's got his family involved. All the kids can't even go to school because their dad's out there. He's a crazy guy building a boat in the desert. So the kids are getting picked on. His wife can't go to ladies' meeting because everyone's looking at your husband's nuts. You know that, right? He's, he's lost. He's, 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 why don't you just kill him? Just walk away. It's bad. There's other men out there. He's not, not crazy. Like, no, Noah's nuts. You know everything was going on. God was silent the entire time until God said, get in the boat. Now it's time. He had enough faith to say, you know what, whether God's speaking to me or not, I'm going to follow the instructions he gave me to the team. And I'm not going to stop until he says stop. Some of y'all quit because you haven't heard from the Lord. Well, if he hasn't changed his instructions, that means he hasn't changed his mind. That means you need to keep doing what he's called you to do. Maybe you've got a little sidetracked. Get back on track. Build an altar. Remember what the Lord has done. Allow his presence to be welcomed back into your life and start following the Lord again. So I asked the question I asked at the beginning. When's the last time you heard from the Lord? When's the last time he spoke to you? Either through word, through prayer, something. When's the last time he spoke to you? God's speaking to me as I'm doing this lesson. I haven't done verse by verse in a long time. God has been speaking to me through this, and hopefully he's speaking to you. But there again, I know if he is speaking to me, he is speaking to you. There's some things in your life that you need to deal with and need to work on, just like I need to work on. For binding the strong man so we can walk in the victory that God's promised to us. It's not, I'm, talk, I'm not talking health, wealth, and prosperity. I'm talking about walking who I am in Christ, period. Who God has called me to be. Does that mean I'm going to be rich? Maybe. Maybe not. I don't know. That's up to the Lord. Does that mean I'm always going to have good health? I don't know. That's up to God. That ain't up to me. I'm going to praise him whatever he's got going on. Paul said, I become content in all situations. If Paul and Silas can pray themselves right out of jail, I think we can too. We can 
praise the Lord and have God open it wide open. Walk right out, no problem. Are you going to trust the Lord? Paul had all kinds of issues. They tried to kill him with stones. The devil tried to shipwreck him, left him in the ocean for a while. Threw him in jail. I mean, come on, the poor guy got let out of a window in a basket. How humiliating is that? Ben, how do you feel? Somebody's letting you out of a window in a basket. <laughs> not a cot, not a rope, not in a basket. So I get this mental image of like, you know, Wizard of Oz carrying a little picnic basket and Paul's in the basket looking out. <laughs> this is the mental image I get. I, I, messed up. I just think it's funny. But he's a little guy. But how humiliating is that? Right? Everywhere that Paul went, they tried to kill him. Man, he got on fire for Jesus and everywhere he went, immediately they tried to kill him. He couldn't win for losing. But God didn't give him another direction other than follow me. Keep following me. Keep doing what I've told you to do. Keep seeking me. God, I'm sick. My grace is sufficient. Dang it. Come on, God, I raised people from the dead. I've seen people come. Help me out. My grace is sufficient. Mm. Yes, Lord. I know that some of us were hanging on white knuckle grip. Yes, Lord. I want to do it another way, but you said. If you trust God, trust him. And go in his peace. Build up the altar in your life. Some of y'all have issues with the presence of the Lord because you have no altar in your life that's honoring God. You have many altars in your life that aren't honoring God. But the one altar you do need to have in your heart, you don't have. Or if you do have because you're a child of God, but you haven't been servicing it, the fire's gone out. Hmm. You wonder why God's not showing up. It's very difficult to get a fire going whenever there's nothing there to get it going. You ain't got no wood on the altar. It's very difficult to start a fire. So what have you put on your altar lately? What have you built there? That God could come in and be the consuming fire and receive the offering. Receive the sacrifice that's being made. Some of you, well, I've been praising God and I'm not getting nothing. Oh, 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 hey. How's your altar doing? Well, I've been seeking the Lord and he's not answering. Really? When's the last time you were honoring the Lord? When's the last time you were really genuinely giving him glory for who he is? When's the last time you really acknowledged who he is? Instead of just going in with your grocery list and praying that he answers it. God can answer your prayer long before you get there if you'll honor him. First. You've got to do that first. You've got to honor God first, period. God will literally move heaven and earth if you'll honor him. Joshua saw the Lord and asked that the sun would stand still, and it did. The sun stood still until the victory was won. God's never done it since. But he also hasn't taken anybody else that we know of other than Elijah since Enoch. That leads me to believe that it's still possible, it just hasn't happened. My question is, how are you walking with the Lord? How am I walking with the Lord? I gotta look at me too. How am I servicing my altar? How am I on an altar that God's placed in my heart? It's not easy. Guys, to be diligent in servicing an altar, it's not easy. To be up in the word and to be in prayer, to be honoring and just giving God glory to invite, it's not easy. It seems like everything that can come against you will come against you when you try to do it. And from areas you never thought imaginable will come against you. You're like, really? That area? Wow, God. Yeah. That's the enemy. He's going to try every tactic he can to get you down. Every avenue that he can use to try to come against you, he will. So I want to remember what the Lord has done. And I'm going to call upon that. And I'm not going to get away from it. And it goes on. A couple things. Interesting to bless and curse. Remember, that Moses said, look, when you go into this country, that this group is supposed to stand on this mountain for blessing and represent the blessing, and they're supposed to speak that. This group is supposed to go to this mountain and speak the curses. Go back and look at it. It is there. The one mountain for the cursing was, its meaning is stone, stony, heap of bareness. Cursing. It's interesting. Now, the other one took me a minute. It took probably a good 20, 30 minutes to really look at this one. It's garrison, which the definition of garrison is cut or cut off. Cut off. But that was supposed to be the place that God declared blessing. 
How does that work? But when God is blessing you, he's separating you from the curse. He has separated us. He's told us that we are to come out from among them. We are to be cut off, as it were, from among them. The place of blessing, we have to cut off those things. We have to be separated from those things that cause the curse. Because what? He said at some point, don't, don't even let these things even be named among you. Do that, you got to cut it off and kill it, right? So I really had to think about that. The names of the places where the blessing was given and the curse was given was, was interesting. The garrison, the place of blessing, is where they would declare the blessings of the Lord was cut or to cut off. In Ebal is a place of stone, stone or a heap of barrenness. This mound just did it. It's interesting. But since they did all this, they declared the word of the Lord, they built the altar, but it's interesting that what Joshua did when he built the altar. He declared, it was verse 35, the last verse of Joshua chapter 8, there was not a word of all that Moses has commanded which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel with the women, the little ones, and the strangers who were living among them. There was not a word left out of the command of the Lord that had been given to Moses that now Joshua had. He did not fail to declare any of it. See, a lot of times we'll read God's word and we want to skip and pick and choose what we read. We get to the areas of the scripture where it talks about names, we're like, hmm. I can't even pronounce half of those names. Try it anyway, it's good. It's a good laugh. Say it out loud so you can laugh at yourself. It's good. But read them. Don't leave out anything of the Lord. See, Paul said, you know, that he said he could run the race. And he, if he died, he said, look, I know that I can go and it'll be well with me because I have not failed to declare to you the whole counsel of the Lord. The whole counsel of the Lord. Here's reality. You're not always going to have a pastor or preacher to come to you to declare to you the whole counsel of the Lord. What are you doing in your personal walk with the Lord? It's up to every man, every woman, every child of God to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling before Him. You're not doing it for your spouse. You're not doing it for your kids. You're not doing it for me or another pastor. You have to do it before the Lord. So how are you doing? You're going in and possessing the promise that God has given you. Maybe you've gotten out of whack. Maybe you've got some sin in your life that God, hey, you need to kill this off. You need to destroy it in your life. It needs to be done in your life. And you've done that, and God's now starting to speak to you again. You're starting to bring clarity again. Are you going to follow His instructions this time? Or are we going to keep going around the same circle and keep repeating the same thing? So I promise you, you'll keep repeating the same thing until you get tired of it. You'll keep going around the wilderness until you get tired of it and say, you know what, enough's enough. I'm ready to receive the promise now. And in so doing, you say, I'm ready to listen to the Lord. I'm ready to listen to everything that He says. I'm ready to be obedient. God wants your obedience way above your sacrifice. If you can be obedient, He'll accept the sacrifice. You do understand that, right? If you're not obedient to sacrifice, the sacrifice is meaningless. So you can be suffering for Jesus, accomplishing nothing. Then you can be included in the ones that says, Lord, Lord. He goes, I don't know you. He knows the ones that obey. The sons of disobedience are set up for the wrath of God. So which team are you playing for? The ones that are under wrath or the ones that are under grace? Because here's the thing. For him that knows better and does not him, that is sin. Pastor, what are you saying? Where does that leave me? I don't know. Where does that leave you? Where does that leave you with the Lord? What has he spoke to you this morning? Maybe you've been like Achan. Maybe you've been trying to hang on to things of the world instead of trusting the Lord. Maybe God's trying to kill that part of Achan of you that's in you off. See, Christ gave you victory on the cross. He gave you dominion. He gave that back to you over everything on the cross, what he did there. But it says if you love the world, you cannot love him. You can't love the things in the world and love him. It's not going to work. You have to let those things go. You have to put them down. You may have to kill them off. Is that easy to do? No. Why? 
Because sometimes we have emotional attachment to these things. They have sentimental value. Let me tell you something. If it's taking you away from God, it's an idol. Period. I don't care what it is. If it's taking you away from God, it is an idol. And that aspect of it needs to die. Because the Bible says you're not worshiping the idols, you are worshiping well, demons. But Pastor, I don't like using that word. I don't like using that word either. But it's God's word, it's the truth. Paul said, do you not know they're not worshiping idols, but they're worshiping demons? That wasn't something new. Paul was repeating the Old Testament. They weren't worshiping idols of wood or stone or anything else. They were worshiping demons. Is that hard for us to accept sometimes? Yes. Is it hard to call things that particular strength of word, as it were? Yes. Because if we acknowledge it that way, that means we have to deal with it in accordance to what it is. I can go to the doctor and have cancer. He can say, well, you're sick. It's all another thing when he tells me I have cancer. Okay, I can go to the doctor and say, I can accept being and say, oh, yeah, you're sick. I don't want to hear I have cancer. I don't want to hear I have some other type of disease that's going to take my life. I don't want to hear that. That's why people won't come to church. They don't want to hear that they got a disease that's going to kill them. And most pastors today won't preach, hey, you got something that's going to kill you and tell you what it is. Well, guys, I'm not one of those pastors. I'm going to tell you the truth. If you have sin in your life, it's going to kill you. If you're saved, praise the Lord. Now you're digging in and taking away your rewards at the judgment. You have white bone drummit, you have judgment of man, story for another time, I'm not going to go into both judgments. That's a big teaching for the time frame we don't have on Sundays. I want every reward that the Father is going to give me. Not that I'm selfish, but I want to be able to give it back to Him. Because the more He gives me, the more I get to bow down and worship Him with at the end. But if you have said in your life, it's going to take away your relationship. It's going to take away your effectiveness. It's going to take away your ability to really see God move in amazing ways. We're supposed to sanctify ourselves unto the Lord. We're supposed to set ourselves apart unto the Lord that we could see amazing things. How many of you in this room today would say, Lord, I want to see amazing things? That's going to take work on your behalf. To say, you know what? I'm going to cut off the things of this world that are taken away from my walk with you. If it's TV, then cut it off. If it's video games, cut them off. If it's people, I love you, cut them off. God will bring you others. To fill that void. God will bring you new people. Okay? I love my family. I do. I cannot be with them all the time because they will cause me to stumble. They will cause me to go backwards. I can't be involved in that. I will visit. I will say hello. I will be loving. I will be kind. And I will be gracious. But I cannot be intimately involved with them the way that I would love to be because they're my family. Because of the sin in their life, the darkness in their life. That darkness is contagious. And it gets on you. And it comes back with you. Mm -hmm. I'm good. Mm -hmm. I don't like bringing stuff back with me. Okay? Sometimes you leave, you come back with parting gifts. There's certain parting gifts you don't want. <laughs> okay? There's certain things you just need to leave alone. It's better for you in the long run. Let the Lord destroy it until it's done. And then go in and do what you got to do. Trust the Lord. Separate, be holy unto the Lord. Be sanctified unto the Lord. If you know you've got something in your life that you need to kill off, do it now before it's too late. Before you miss out on opportunity. Before you miss on what the Lord wants to do for you. Moses didn't get in, remember? Moses, Aaron, they decided they were going to do their own thing and not trust the Lord. They didn't go into the land of promise. Joshua Caleb did. Because their hearts stayed true to the Lord, what the Lord had said. <clears throat> they went in. Moses, he said, no, you're not going to go in. You didn't listen to me. You will see it, but you're not going to enter it. How many of you would feel horrible to see the promise of the Lord but not be able to receive it? Because you decided, you know what? I'm going to do things my way. Ouch. It's the same God. It's the same God. I don't want you to miss out on any good thing from the Lord. The Bible says that we've been given every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Every spiritual. I want all of them. But pastor, that's selfish. No, it's not. The Bible says it's mine. So I want it. I want it in my life. I want it in your life. I want you to experience the blessings of the Lord. I want you to experience the joy of the Lord. I want you to experience the power of God working in your life. That when you go in ministry, then you go and do things, and you go to pray for somebody, and the power of God comes off of you, and you see deliverance. You see healing. You see lives change. You see God move. 
This is a man that's been coming up to the homeless thing on a Thursday night and said, had an issue with his leg. God has brought about healing in his leg. The poor guy couldn't hardly stand, even with help. Up there, no cane, wrap on his leg, moving, but no problem. Through prayer. And it was said, next time we see you, you're not going to need this. You're going to be fine. Guess what? At least the next time I saw him, he didn't have it. He didn't have the cane. He was walking just fine. No problem. God will bring about deliverance. If you're walking in obedience, God will do what he says he will do. <laughs> Guys, I want you to be encouraged this morning. I want you to be blessed. I want you to be lifted up. I want you walking with the Lord. I want you to understand that you have to take care of the strong man in any situation before you can move forward. So God told Joshua, the, the land is yours. Go in and possess it. Didn't mention the 30-something kings he had to go against. I think it's 32, actually. There are going to be some things that you're going to have to face along the way to receive your promise. It's okay. I'm glad God doesn't give us all the details because we worry ourselves right out of the promise. Some of you have stressed yourself right out of the promises of the Lord in your life. You've become so stressed and so aggravated and so fed up and tired and dismayed and discouraged. You, you walk right out of what God wants for you. He says, the door's still open. Come on back. Some of you this morning to hear God saying, come on back. Come on back. The door's open. Come on. That blessing, that promise is still here. Come on. Are you tired of wandering? Come on. It's time to get on the other side of it. Oh, you got aching in your life? Take some out of the broken or something. Stop the aching, amen? Cheap fun, but it works. Let God come in and take that out of your life. Walk with the Lord. See victory in every area of your life. I'm not trying to get your hopes up in a false way. I'm telling you the word of God, when you follow it, it happens. Every time. Without question. When you do what God says. Every time. This morning... The Lord has spoke to you in a particular area. Deal with it today. Don't leave here and still carry it. Kill it all. Okay? If God's revealed, hey, you got something in your tent that needs to die? Take it to the altar this morning. Take it before the Lord. Break it off. So we still have our basket up here. Somehow I got put underneath my podium. This was a makeshift altar, if you will. There's nothing that's basket. Okay? It's symbolic to say, you know what? I'm going to take that thing in my life. I'm going to write it out. I'm Because, you know, sometimes things don't become real until we start writing it out. Right? Oh, they had to write the covenant. All the kings had to write the whole covenant. It's interesting. Anyway, it becomes more real when we get to write it out. Then we take that thing, and now it's something tangible. We're going to place it on the altar before the Lord. Say, God, I know what you did on the cross. I'm receiving what you did on the cross. I'm taking this thing in my life, and then symbolically, I'm going to place it here back on the altar, and I'm going to let it die. I'm going to let it be crucified in my life. I think I've used this once. Not to say anything, but that one time that I did use it, God took that thing away from me that was bothering and plaguing my conscience. Because the enemy kept coming back and nagging at me about something. I said, you know what? I'm done with this. I know the Lord has forgiven me. I am done. I don't know what. You know what? Hmm. And I left it there. And it seems silly. But I, at that moment, I said, God, I am trusting you with this completely and fully. I'm done. I'm doing this as an act of faith. God, it's nothing more than what it is, but I'm trusting you that in the supernatural that you're going to take this thing. The enemy's not going to use it against me anymore, and I'm going to walk in freedom from this thing. That's been a few months. No problems. The devil tries to remind me, I'm like, you know what? You can say what you want. It doesn't bother me anymore. Because at the time, it was still bothering me. Until I laid it down before God. I took that thing of Achan and I killed it. Symbolic. We know that Christ took care of all of it on the cross. Amen? Amen. We're not taking the place of Christ. We're just, again, this is an act of faith that's all this. It's nothing supernatural. There's no voodoo. There's no nothing. <laughs> it's an act of faith before the Lord. Again, you've got to do some things by faith. Walking around Jericho silent, that was an act of faith. This morning, I have cards back there if you want to write on the card. I'm sure people around you have notebook and pen and paper. We can make it happen this morning. If you're willing to take a symbolic act of faith, say, you know what? This thing in my life, I am done. God, I'm signing it over to you. I'm signing title deed to you, God. I'm done with it. 
this morning in our time that we're getting ready to go into a praise and worship, that's you, do it. Well, Pastor, that's just silly. Hey, all I have to say is it works. There's a lot of things I think are silly. But God has me do silly things, and he, he, he does the work. I don't know how it works out. He asked me to pray over people, lay hands in different ways and different things, and I'm like, okay, God, that's a little awkward, but sure, no problem. And God will work and move. Hey, you know, when you go to them, I want you to say this to them. And they're like, hey, how did you know that? Again, there's certain times that God will tell you to do things that are absolutely foolish. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. He's had you do some crazy things. You're like, what? Okay. You end up driving to a place. You're like, why am I driving here? Oh. All right. He had me sit at a convenience store for three and a half hours. Instead of working. I was supposed to be working. <laughs> God said, no, you're going to wait. For what? I can't drink any more soda. My bladder's going to explode. <laughs> It was free, so that's pretty important. I'm sitting there for three and a half hours. I try to leave. Gus says, go back in the store. I want to go. I got stuff to do. He goes, yeah, you do. You have something to do. Go back in the store. And got the witness to a gentleman that was hurting. I thought he was going to kill me. I had a smart mouth comment that I made. Um, this guy's like 6'6". Six, six, told me he was Catholic. I said, that's okay. You can still be saved. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> He laughed about it. I'm like, whoo! He didn't kill me. But by the end of that, this six foot six big guy. I'm a big guy. I can handle my own. This guy was big. I was actually intimidated. There ain't many people that intimidate me. This guy intimidated me. He was sobbing like a baby. I mean, like the whole snot, everything. He was bad. And then I asked him if I could pray for him. He goes, right here in the store. I'm like, you're a snotty mess and you're worried about me praying over you? <laughs> well, I guess not. And, and we pray. But God had me there that entire time just for that one guy. But see, there was people watching that happen. So it wasn't just for him, there's people watching. The Lord had me in a store in a conversation when I was with Brian. We stopped at a convenience store. I don't know what, really? It's funny. I guess I have a convenience store ministry or something. <laughs> this is testimony, guys. This is God working. We're in there, he, he, Ryan's getting a sandwich, getting something to eat, and I was in there just to chit-chat. Next thing I know, this lady says something, I'm a good person. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that started like an hour-long conversation. Ryan, he got to speak hall. He sits down and sees his food and watches. So we're sitting there talking, and she's sitting there telling me this long, drawn-out story about this and that, and how she's doing this, but she wants her kids to go to church, she don't go to church. And I'm like, oh, wow. I said, but you're still a good person. I said, how do you justify that it's okay to lie, that it's okay to steal, that it's okay to commit adultery, it's okay to murder, and all these things, but you're still a good person? Well, okay, I, I'm not a good person, but, I, you know, and she began to try to justify where she was at in her life. Reality is where she was hurting, and she was broken. I said, look, I, I'm, I'm probably not going to get you to step back to church, and I'm not. that's not my focus. What I would like to see is you come back to a relationship with God. I said, apparently at some point you had a relationship, and you walked away, and I don't know why, but you're at least trying to get your kids to go so they have a foundation out of your own mouth. You want them to go so they have some type of foundation in their life that's right. I said, there's something in you that knows that is a desperate need. You need to go back. And uh, she finally had enough. She wasn't here anymore. I had to say she kind of walked off. I said, well, ma'am, can you, would you at least read your Bible? Whether you go to church or not, would you at least spend some time in your Bible? I know you have one. At least spend some time there. Well, and then she, got, she shut the conversation off. Lord, I did what you asked me to do. I shared, and I did what I needed to do. <coughs> There's people like, man, I love watching people do that. <laughs> I didn't realize I had an audience at this point. I had no idea. At that moment, it was just me and her. But it blessed those that were watching as well. You never know who you're going to minister to. I walked, I walked two people through the good person test. The one I was talking to didn't affect it all. The one I wasn't talking to was crying like a baby. Because they're like, I got done, I looked over, I'm like, are you okay? You were talking to me. You have a different perspective than I did, apparently. And led them to the Lord. 
Again, God will ask you to do silly things that you may see that that's not going to be effective. God's word does not return for you. Amen. Amen. So again, this morning, act of faith. Do something you've never done this morning. Maybe it's, you know what, I'm going to get on my knees before the God. I've never done that. Okay, get on your knees before the Lord. Well, I've never raised my hands in worship. Okay, try that. If you didn't worry to order it, go halfway. Be courteous. <laughs> I say it to be funny. Here's the thing, God. I'm going to love you no matter what, whether you stink or don't stink. I'm going to love you. Neighbors, you better love your neighbor. Because there's times you stink and they don't say nothing. Sometimes you stink here and they don't say nothing. And I don't mean just because you have bad breath. <laughs> love one another. Worship the Lord freely this morning. Some of you, maybe you need to lay before the Lord, lay prostrate before the Lord. That's okay, lay prostrate before the Lord. But try something out of faith this morning that you've never done. So, Lord, I'm going to strengthen my faith. I'm going to do something I've never done. I'm going to trust you in a way I have never trusted you, God. I know that I can't keep doing things in my comfort zone and expect you to do something greater. i got to do something I've never done. Maybe i got to be quiet and walk around Jericho. Lord, whatever it is, I'll do that. I've seen people do that. I've seen people walk out of church and just walk the entire time going back in and God just move. I mean, they didn't even make it halfway back in the door. God just, boom, way later. It was great. <laughs> but God moved in their life. No one touched them. No one said anything to them. They were obedient to the Lord <coughs> and God delivered them. Awesome. Again, trust the Lord. Listen to me. I'm going to ask everyone to stand.